There. Welcome everyone to Aaron Sullivan's Zoom meeting on the evolutionary awakening of a spiritual astrology. Aaron will show how hardcore religion and dogma, all the domains of Zeus and Jupiter, became a spiritual revolution when Neptune was sighted, opening the door to an outstanding era in the realm of religious experience and so spiritual solace. Solace. Aaron will experience this transition. I'm sorry. Aaron will explore this transition and archetype and its relevance today and possibly the future. For more information, you can go to AaronSullivan.com where you will find two training courses and hundreds of MP3s. Welcome, Aaron, from all of us. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, right. Um, Sorry, as I as I mentioned, there was a, I mean, and I suppose we could say because um, <clears throat> Neptune actually is the ruler of of lightning, and we have this huge lightning uh, storm, which is normal because in the southwest we have monsoon periods, and so I had uh, it's a mess the desk and. Um, because I wasn't able to get on until about five minutes ago. And, and it's now just really cloudy and dark. So that's uh, not bad to, you know, for what they call um, sympathetic pathos in theater, where the environment actually, uh, you know, coincides or, or you know, is in, in sympathy with the what's happening. And here we are talking about Neptune. Now, <clears throat> when we think... I want to start off with, um, because I call it an evolution toward a spiritual astrology, okay? So there is no spiritual astrology that I know of, you know, to speak, um, you know, literally. There is an attitude that we have that has a spiritual basis, and we have... Um, you know, our spirituality imprinted, embedded, if you will, and also uh, in our psyches um, as part of what we will talk about in Neptune. But also we're, um, we have a very long history of astrology. And it strikes me that, of course, it goes back much further than 3,867, give or take, you know, 100 years or so. It goes back to the beginning of time, because from the beginning of time, it's known from cave paintings of 40,000 years ago and so on, that there was an awareness of some kind of uh, experience that the French called participation mystique. This was not considered to be a spiritual movement or anything like that. What participation mystique means is <clears throat> that I am or you are at one with your with nature. So that you are the tree that you are looking at. You are the animal that you have, you know, sacredly killed so that your people can eat. And you are at one with that animal so that you are in a mystical participation. And so I I was kind of stuck for a while because I thought, okay, this is a really big topic. Neptune is huge. We've got an hour. Um, but I wanted to go back to this particular um, tract here. Oh, I keep wanting to, to get rid of the, the side. Oh, there it is. Right. This is a, a tablet that is now in the British Library, British Museum. And it is from um, Amasataku, who which refers to the record of astronomical observations of Venus. Now, you know, there's so many people, well, I mean, I wrote Retrograde Planets, which was my sort of, you know, my debt to astrology. And it was, you know, the Venus cycle was probably the most amazing thing that I really fully, I'd never fully grokked it, you know. I hadn't really understood. Same with, with Mercury, although I'd come, I'd come to Mercury much earlier, Hermes. But the observations of Venus, as, per, as, as actually are, you know, shown on this uh, tablet, are to the day, if you will, 
of how long the synodic period was. And it details, the, as it says here, the movement of Venus as we know it today. The omens are derived from the date when Venus is first visible on the horizon and its entire synodic period of 584 days. I've also, I want to get rid of this sidebar. This is really in my way. How do I do that? Um, I really, it's, I can't see. I really need to get rid of this sidebar. Is there, how do I do that? Okay, Erin, I just, pressed, it's okay. I pressed minus and it did something, but. Okay, still thank not. you. Okay. Wow, it's really in my way. Um, okay, so, all right. So this is the oldest known astrological text. And in a book that I had the great, um, a pleasure of actually discovering uh, from Michael Bajant back in the mid 80s uh, when I was living in London and you know being the editor for um, the contemporary astrology series I was visiting Michael and um, it was really quite amusing I said we don't happen to have any you know sort of um, loose manuscripts that are unpublished hanging around do you and he says oh it just so happens that I do and he hops up opens his desk drawer tidy as it was and pulls out this manuscript and so I and then his wife asked him if she could come and help he could come and help her with the kids or something you know and so he leaves and I started to look at it and I went I don't believe this this is amazing and so I, I said listen I'm going to take it with me I said I think you know we can do something with it and and I published it Michael has since died uh, in 2014. His book was reintroduced um, through Inner Traditions Press as Astrology in Ancient Mesopotamia. So there's a new edition. It's exactly the same. So it's from the Almonds of Babylon. The next book that I would like to recommend uh, is for your interests would be the history of astrology nick campion and ancient astrology which a lot of people don't know about but i actually reviewed um uh years ago in the uh uh esar journal when i was doing um the bibliophile and it's it's absolutely a must buy tamson barton ancient astrology really good so we have you know evidence that the astrology was reasonably sophisticated and it goes back um you know essentially to the ancient days when we had um the oracles um and the oracle of delphi goes back much longer than we think and and so our our, our mystical tradition really dates back millennia, millions and millions of years, billions of years, as um, uh, Sagan would have said. But the, the Oracle at Delphi, because I want to go into to the Greeks a bit, as I, I tend to want to do, um, that the Greeks had uh, also a a very, very interest, a very great interest in, in, in um, astrology. It wasn't a spiritually based astrology. It was based on, what it says here, techne versus ours. In other words, the intellect and science versus art and spirit. And what happens when we get that uh, dialectic going um, these days, today, it's usually just a complete and utter disaster to try and argue, you know, with a scientist because they get really nervous and anxious and angry and, and very choked about the whole uh, discussion, whereas the astrologer usually sits there looking pretty calm and not particularly, you know, out of his mind with his or her mind with anxiety about trying to prove anything. So, you know, we do have a strong history, and this is primarily a Western view, okay, Western civilization, that that really originated, you know, sort of 2,500 years ago in, in the ancient uh, Peloponnese. Oh, Sorry, I'm really having a problem with this uh, 
thing. I wish I could make it go sideways. So we're really looking at, um, you know, a very a long and ancient history uh, of what we do in our practices today. And this is a, a shot of, of Delphi as it was. Now, the Oracle of Delphi uh, wasn't an astrologer. Um, there was a very rude form of astrology in the Roman period of time, um, but it didn't have anything to do with the soul or the concept of soul. It, it, all the astrology up until now, and this is having, because we're doing an hour talk, a little bit of a blanket statement, but all astrology really up until the sighting of Neptune really had no sort of longing to emerge out of the mists of Avalon or the magical mists of the ancient world. Um, there was no real uh, need to turn it into spirituality, if you will. In fact, that word is, is an adjective. Spiritual is an adjective. Spirituality is the act of, the, of being spiritual. It comes obviously from spirit. So there is some you know, root to the sense of eudaimon, which in Greek is, is, was what Socrates was always talking about, and the eudaimon being the, the good spirit, the good soul, the good will of, of humanity. And so we actually now look into astrology and to horoscopes and planets to try and find a way of expressing or find how they may themselves in character express you know, this eudaimon, this good spirit, this good genius, if you will, daimonion. And here I've got a little picture of the Pythia again, because she was actually the last oracle of Delphi. And it hinted at a new form of uh, visionaryness. Now, the god Poseidon, you know, ruler of earthquakes and their resultant tsunami, it's commonly thought that it's Uranus, rules your square. It doesn't. Um, it might uh, rule because a tsunami is the result of an earthquake, and that's a, a, an oceanic experience. That's Poseidon. And so Neptune actually has indeed the, uh, it's up here, the, the little um, trident with which he will hit the earth and, uh, and bring on an earthquake, and then it, a resultant uh, you know, in incredible flooding. So it, it brings to mind the whole concept of just being on the seas. And the horses are, are also Poseidon uh, symbols, images, and, and his familiars, um, because they, they represent the, the waves, okay? So that as the waves are dashing in on the shore, we, can, we could actually say, you know, as a modern person, Oh, there's there's the, the, the waves of Poseidon dashing on the shores, a time to for the earth and the sea to somehow cross the threshold and enter a state where we're not just in between, but for sort of, you know, in both. And that would be a modern version of participation mystique, where we're experiencing both. And I think it's important to look at the symmetry of the old rulers and understand why it was very difficult for some of the older astrologers um, to understand the usurping of planets. Now look how tidy it is. Um, it's, it's set for um, the moon and the sun and Mercury and Mercury, and Venus, and Venus, Mars, and Mars, Jupiter, and Jupiter, Saturn, and Saturn. Who would want to mess with that? I mean, that is so elegant, and so beautiful, and so incredibly archaic. <laughs> so we end up with this overthrowing, if you will, of the old rulers, and symmetry, which was very significant in the ancient astral, astrological world was symmetry, and it was full of all sorts of, and, and many people are, are re, you know, studying ancient astrology in order to be able to understand our roots and, and you know, where some of the terminology comes from, which is very elegant. I mean, 
I'm really fond. I've got like Mars and Saturn and Pluto and Leo in my ninth house. And I really like, um, you know, the sort of formalities of, of language. And, you know, I really love the language of the law, for instance, and, and, and of, of medicine, you know, simply because it's all dates back to the ancient Romans and, and the Greeks. Um, and so when we look at symmetry, as we just saw, we got a sense of comfort. There was something really sort of soothing about that picture. There's something not soothing about this picture. And it's because there's nothing soothing about monumental change when it comes in the form of a demand, if you will, from the global psyche, from the mass, from, the, from Gaia's very core, because that's us on Earth looking east and west and to the meridian and to the icy. So what we end up with is not the same tidy little rulership or, or uh, situation, especially when Uranus was first um, cited, which also shows um, uh, some respect of the scientists, by the way, some very, very, very respectful of in the naming, because naming is very important. Nomos is, you know, um, the law. Whereas fusis is nature. So we have nomos, name, law, fusis, nature, uh, uh, nature, and, and basically the root of science, physics. Okay? So we're looking at suddenly the sighting of Uranus. And I did a talk on that before, and I have whole courses on this, by the way, um, evolution. But on this date, Everything changed, absolutely everything. And it was very, I thought, respectful when I really started thinking, okay, why did they name them that? Um, they named them because they were going on the basis of the old relationship of the planets uh, to the ancient gods. So out of the realm of the <clears throat> mists of the ancient gods came a new god, Uranus. The symmetry I'm talking about is, is, is actually quite elegant. And that is, is that Mars is the son of Jupiter. Jupiter is the son of, Uran, of Saturn. Saturn is the son of Uranus. And Neptune and Pluto are brothers on the, uh, on the Olympiad. So there was some kind of participation mystique with the, the scientists who would have us hung and shot and burned at the stake. Um, even today, well, not literally, well, perhaps maybe literally, you never know. Um, but we now see that we've got this whole new, you know, uncomfortable rearrangement of planets. When it came to the sighting of Neptune, I mean, I kind of got... Uh, you know, and I was like projecting uh, anthropomorphically upon the planets. I was saying, well, gee, you know, Saturn must have been really kind of ticked off about, you know, the struggle between Uranus and him for rulership of the sign of Capricorn, um, but, or, I mean, sorry, of the sign of Aquarius. But, you know, uh, if science is God, then the gods had named that Uranus would now be the ruler of Aquarius, and that's all. That's it. <clears throat> we still think in terms of Saturn as having some influence there. Yes, definitely. There's always that undercore in the Uranian Aquarian, uh, <clears throat> sorry, personality type, um, or or circumstance to describe, of rigidity. I mean, where you know, they don't, it's not about change. It's a fixed sign, first of all. And um, Aquarius is interesting. I really like Jason Hawley's talk on the whole idea of the split, the necessary split of the control function and, and the, the distancing function of being able to separate one's own self from um, a participation in whatever it is that one is doing and, uh, and kind of go into a higher state. 
which is kind of what happens to me when I'm, I'm actually reading a chart, although I'm very, very, very rigorous about what I'm reading, what I'm saying, what I'm talking. I don't go into some kind of trance. But I do seem to have, you know, able to call on some stuff that I hadn't actually thought of before while I was talking about it. That's what astrology is. I mean, it, it's a participation mystique. Yes, there are laws and there are rules and there are regulations. There have to be. But there is also another element to it, and literally element when you think of it. Um, and it has to do with the ethers, of what's going to come down through the ethers. And so I think that it was really important um, you know about the discovery of planets and, and another greek word just to be you know really fancy um katarsh k-a-t-a-r-c-h that's not in in our Latin, in our alphabet and it, it means beginning okay the beginning now that 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 is like a real beginning not just like um beginning to do your your workshop uh, the katarsh is like as an astrological term it's the the t moment in time in which the horoscope is cast. Yeah. So for whatever reason it's being cast. So that if we cast a horoscope for the sighting, which I've done endlessly uh, for the discovery of a planet, and we will be looking at Neptune briefly again, then we have everything that's possible to know in that horoscope. It is present. And it's about how do we get to that knowledge. That's where I think Neptune can come in. One thing you're just seeing about these discovery horoscopes of Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, every single discovery chart has the moon in Scorpio between 7 and 13 degrees. Every single one. So, I mean, there's something about love with the mystery. Neptune, when it was sighted, I'm going to move on. Okay, so here we are rapidly moving forward from cave days of 40,000 millennia ago, um, 40,000 years. We're, we're here in, a, in the age of Pisces. And even Jung wrote about the age of Pisces. He wrote about the fishes as a symbol of a dying age. He was a Christian, which is you know, part of why he, you know, became so questioning of the psyche and the spirit and the soul was that he had a, a really big problem with, with Christianity. His father was a, you know, a, a minister. And so he, you know, had a lot of issues with religion. And so his whole, uh, the piece is brilliant to read, but you have to, you know, kind of block out the, the Christian parts of it. But the age of Pisces is the age of, uh, well, actually, um, you know, according to the uh, uh, the Hebraic uh, year, it began 5,777 years ago this year, 2017, um, uh, which is considered to be around the time when Adam and Eve were created. So they're really old, okay, the Hebrews, the he Jews. And then we get into Christianity, which has got some kind of arbitrary, you know, zero, yeah? And it is involving the tripartite gods um, of uh, what I call the unholy trinity. And I think it really had to do with the epoch, okay? We had to move into another epoch. They're all sons of, of Abraham, the tripartite gods, of the Western mind involve orthodoxy, religion, and science. And the, you know, tripartite gods are currently, as we speak, fighting like the Greeks and the Romans did in the course of their downfall. I mean, when I saw, I mean, when I, I think of, of the battlefield of Troy, I think of, the, the, of it as a, as a, um, a kind of world writ large you know it's like 2017 writ large you know we've still got the you know Achilles sulking in his tent you know because you know Agamemnon stole his girlfriend from him it was just horrific I mean that would have been the most horrible thing to have happened would have been and it was probably one of the first very 
real wars was the Trojan War, thus beginning Western civilization, basically. Um, monotheism and the transcendent gods of Abraham, in other words, they're descended from, from the end of the Minoan culture and the rise of the Mycenaean period, the Minoan culture is a goddess earth-based um, culture. I don't remember what slide is next. I'm going to go back. Um, but the Minoan culture actually has a date. And it seems that what happened was in a time frame um, when we experienced um, not just Troy, but just part the, the collapse of, of Crete and the explosion, the um, volcano on Thera, actually marked by, you know, resonance and also synchronicity, the departure, if you will, of the uh, goddess worship. And what then descended from the north is what it always says. It's descended from the north. Well, descended from the north obviously has to do with the Teutonic gods like Wotan. I mean, it's like the sort of the, the uh, Wagnerian opera, Gotterdammerung, um, bad, not very good pronunciation of German, but Gotterdammerung means uh, the the de decline of the gods. So the decline of the ancient gods and the the tradition of where we are now in the age of Pisces, I mean, even, you know, um, uh, an author from the 8th century <clears throat> BCE, um, Hesiod wrote something called the Theogony, which I call the, the begats of the gods. And he moans, he actually complains that he was born in the age of iron. And I, and I, and of course, being an astrologer and, you know, going to classics late in life, like midlife, uh, 38 degrees or 38 years, I just went, oh my God, because it's a section in Hesiod's Theogony that's called the decline of the metals. And it goes from the golden age, which was the age of Leo, to the silver age, which was the age of cancer to the uh, Bronze Age, which is the age of copper, and um, <clears throat> uh, v uh, bronze, you know, which is copper and another metal, I'm sorry, and into the age of iron, which was, of course, the age, the Mars Age, and the age of, of uh, Aries. And he didn't know that he was sitting on you know, because he was saying, oh, I've been born in this age of war and it's all been nothing but terror and turmoil. And I'm looking at the age of Pisces and thinking, well, gee, it's only got more sophisticated in the fact that we are hugely dominated by, at the closure, you know, um, mythologically, philosophically, and, and possibly astronomically, really leaving behind the age of Pisces uh, and entering the age of Aquarius. So we were dominated by a tripartite god head and also by science. So when I think in terms of um, of like what the age of Pisces has brought to us, I'm wondering myself why if it's so spiritual that it has been nothing but persecution and war i mean just think in terms of the religions that are involved in the origins of you know since the crucifixion and and since the beginning of you know the hebrews what happened with them and and Masada and all of the historical aspects of, of what really is the absolute utter core of the Piscean Age, um, it, it doesn't seem to have a lot to do with, with spirituality. It has a lot to do with religion, or, or as I've got here, Ryle Ligion. Anyway, um, so if we look at Jupiter and Zeus, 
he's still involved. You know, he was usurped by Neptune, but he's still the arbiter of social and political justice. He's retained his hierarchical stance because after the overthrow of Chrono Saturn, um, you know, it still remains that the sky, remain, you know, is still a very powerful place of divinity. We lie on our backs and we look at the sky and we feel that we are, we have come, you know, we're lying on the, on the introvert face between Gaia and, and Uranus. And Saturn, remember, from the old myths that I've probably gone on and on about with you guys, is, of course, the one who split them forever. And so here we are, poor little creatures, real soft little things, people, walking about um, in, the, in this, this, this sort of horizon, if you will, between the ancient heavens and the unification with the ancient Gaia. And, and all we are is we're the, the sort of uh, thing on the surface, the, in between the sky and the heavens, fighting uh, the most horrific wars. And this has been going on and on and on. When you consider, I mean, in 325 AD, the Council of Nicaea declared women as soulless beings. I mean, when you read things like that with a mind like we've got, you're just aghast. <laughs> I like that word. Um, I I just think that I, I just don't know how to, to take it. I just think, oh, where did that come from? Okay, it, where, and where it's come from is, of course, somewhere out there in the world, there is no feminine function, okay? That there is an Uranian or sky-based god and series of gods and many many gods and the earth gods aren't particularly goddesses aren't particularly well represented let's put it that way um i am longing to write a book i'm having a really hard time because of all the work i have to do to do stuff but i want to write a book called hades and his ladies and it will be based upon the rise of the feminine and the, the gender morphing that's taking place. But it's not going to be a rant. I'm not a feminist. I'm a, a, just a person, a woman. I happen to be a female. I have children. I, I like boys. I, had a, I have a grandson. Men are great. Um, it's, just a, it, it's a function of the masculine in the Jungian sense that's a problem, okay? Because it really hasn't civilized itself in the way which um, we would like to see it. Okay, so what we were looking back in, in the Minoan period with this earth-based culture and um, women, you know, really being the caretakers. I mean, it's really been about, you know, from 3000 BCE that we have know that we can date the fall of the feminine ethos. And so in our social, social structures, and you've seen that on the diagram, they Saturn and Jupiter both hold social cultural realms, and Jupiter still rules the ninth house, but he rules it in a different way. I mean, yes, it rules higher education and literature and you know vocabulary and language and other countries. I mean, if it weren't for my Jupiter, Venus, and Sagittarius, <clears throat> you know, I don't know what my ninth house it would be like, you know, in another world and thousands of years ago if it were possible. I have no idea. So the thing about Neptune is that, and I've shown you this slide before, is that, you know, it's sort of elusive, sort of. In other words, we saw it once, we saw it twice, we saw it a third time, and I can move on. And there's Galileo, clever looking fellow. He was brilliant. I mean, he thought it was a fixed star. Now, about this um, period of time, I need to explain that when uh, Neptune was sighted, it was already the beginning of the rise of a new way of thinking in our own era, our own epoch, okay, in the Piscean epoch. And there were already divisions of ideologies. In other words, science versus art. It's very interesting. And 
Blake was a tremendous advocate of of uh, of natural science of of you know the nomosphius's argument did not occur to him the idea was that he would talk about you know um fifth century athens or he would think in terms of where we are now but he did not like and many many artists did not really see that the oncoming science as it were going to be and the hubris of newton because this is about newton right with his calipers acting as god and there is another picture of newton uh, with his calipers along a scroll designing the earth uh, into the masculine formation so william blake he died in 1827 and neptune was cited like um gosh oh god it was like 1846 and so he only died uh, 20 years before it was cited. And you see, I think that when something is about to be seen, but yet still lurks somewhere in that strange place between the seeing and the not seeing, um, that we, we start to get a premonition. Now, there's a whole lot of things about premonition and uh, terminologies that I wanted to speak about and then of course is it Neptune oh boy see that storm really did get me because I seem to have lost some things that I wanted to talk about and one of them had to do with the whole concept of how in ancient astrology um, and in modern times uh, the words that we use in ancient astrology or astrology period or anything that have to do with omens and, and sort of delphic oracles uh, all synonym, synonyms for omens have actually been translated in, in meaning into negative implications so for example here's a list of, of portents Omens, harbinger, augury, boding, presage, signs. All those words have got, are really have a bad reputation. And it's because they speak to something that is outside the tangible world. And so the early Greeks had these, because we are, you know, basically descendants of the Greeks. Um, in in Western our Western society, the early Greeks had those kinds of had beliefs, you know, that we still use today. Like for example, when you're walking by a herm, which is like a, a stone uh, pile uh, that's dedicated to Hermes, and they're always found at crossroads or, you know, just at various parts along a path where you're walking, you know, to the next uh, um, village or whatever. And there's also a herm outside of every ancient Greek um, door because he has, a, you know, he rules threshold crossings. But he was also um, part of prognostication, Hermes. And so shrines were uh, erected for him. And we still do this, um, like, for instance, the Romans, they had many auguries and, and superstitions. Again, it's a word that implies negative ethos today. For example, always curse them, the flight of birds. You know, I said, well, the birds are flying this way, therefore, the question you just asked means that blah, blah, and there's the answer. Uh, or uh, another wonderful word called haruspikis, which is, you know, haruspects was a person who interpreted the entrails. <laughs> um, you've heard of that, gut gazing. Literally, that's what the word actually means, haruspects, to look in the guts. But it's also something we do today. For example, in the uh, Roman world, they had something called the Sortes Virgilianae, which was, it means the, Vir the Virgilian lots, because Virgil was the great writer of the Romans, according to the Romans. And it's a form of divination by what I would call bibliomancy, in other words, book uh, prediction, mantics, interpretation. So that 
and you will, you will probably do this to yourself. In fact, I would practice it because I, I really find it important. Is if you have a really something burning in question, is to open a book that you consider to be pretty important, and the first line you read is the answer to the question. It's like the I Ching, ancient, ancient, you know, Chinese, beautiful, elegant, complex oracular system. It's not unlike you're simply rolling the dice or opening a book to the page and reading the first thing. So, you know, from this like earliest known place that I showed you of the Mesopotamian tablets, we also know that the belief in things beyond our intellect are much older than our current Piscean age. And we still have like even just the remnants of the Greek sky gods you know, who come in the form of the ancient gods, as I point out. And um, and in Greece, the Greeks actually still do take their mythology seriously. I mean, they never had a, a, a reformation in their orthodoxy, in their religion. And uh, as a result, they, they, they still leave out little offerings to the gods uh, just in case, as we all should, I think. You know, and as I, I mentioned, um, you know, we still have those uh, those aspects of, of of sort of a theocracy of a, the descendant descending of the of the of the gods from the heavens. Now, the thing about spirituality, okay, that we were talking, or I was sort of starting to talk about, is that. Um, at the time that Saturn was sighted, because we looked, you, you've probably been reading this, so I'm going to move over um, to where Galileo sees it for the first time, okay? Now, here's the thing. He sees it, but he thinks it's a fixed star because Jupiter is a known wanderer, okay? And the thing is, is that Neptune was retrograde when he saw it. One month later, after Jupiter had gone retrograde, because if they're, they're going to be in the same sign, in the same relationship in near opposition to the sun, it's going to be retrograde. So now they're, they're exactly, of course, they're, they're, um, uh, you know, their, their declination would be different, possibly, maybe because he wouldn't have seen them because it would have been completely obliterated by Jupiter. So obviously the declination at the time must have been fairly distant so that he could actually see both. I mean, mind you, it was through a telescope. But both Jupiter and Neptune were retrograde. And so he was still mistaken thinking that it was going to be uh, a fixed star. All right, so finally, it's seen. And it's seen, and there's that seven Scorpio moon. And what it seems to do is it marks a time in which our world, it's like Saturn had to apprehend Neptune to, to give it solidity, um, you know, to be able to contain it like a gas is contained by a lead cylinder for example. And so, I, I mean, the symbolism in every, any katarch, any horoscope that, 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 that's the beginning of something, it's very important to make, to, 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 to be silly and to start to try and understand it based upon, you know, the, the, the real hardcore astrology and not get too mythic because, I mean, the fact is, is that, you know, Saturn does rule lead and Neptune rules gas and there you go. Now, here in this time frame, because Neptune does rule gas, oil was struck exactly 13 years afterwards, uh, after Neptune's sighting in 1859. And in that same time frame, um, New York City was uh, lit by gas. The United States natal horoscope has Neptune at 25 degrees of Aquarius. And so we have had, as a country, but also as a world, the whole world, has actually had a full compass of 
Neptune. We now have had Neptune through every single sign. Pluto's only gone halfway through. It's opposing the United States sun, okay? So because it was born with the sun-Pluto conjunction and Pluto went round and now it's opposing it. So what we've got here with Neptune sighting is that it was then becomes the ruler of Pisces and it was also the beginning, the rise of the Theosophical Society where we had um, Madame Blavatsky and um, Annie Besant uh, beginning to work in the direction of bringing the East and the Western religions together. In fact, a Canadian astro uh, naval officer, Brigadier General Firebrace uh, from Montreal, uh, he was actually one of the founders of the Theosophical, Theosophical. In other words, the God, the philosophy of the of Theos, of the gods, right? And and trying to unite the sort of Buddhist sects and the and the Christian and bringing it together. And they were set in, living in Benares uh, in India, which I guess things I thought would be much more. But they tried to take it to New York, which wasn't quite. Uh, didn't work out very well. But Brigadier General Firebrace is quite interesting. You should Google him because it I didn't realize I'd forgotten, but he actually was one was the founder, one of the founders of the uh the A Astrological Association of Great Britain. And he was well known as an astrologer and he had was really influential in work in writing and creating journals and so on and ephemerides. And I had forgotten about that. And, and he was um, around in those times and during a very important period when we really had to um, realize that, you know, if Neptune is going to be, you know, uh, of any real value, that what we're doing is we're looking at, um, you know, our, its origins. And so it's, you know, when you think in terms of, what was happening at the time of its origins and what has come to now as it's returned to its place and moved beyond into the sign of Pisces, it's, it's you know, the ruler of. <clears throat> we were looking, um, you know, back to that origin period. And also um, one thing that became very important was a, a, a doctor named uh, Mesmer. He became entranced by animal magnetism. So did Freud. He was very interested in, in, uh, in um, being able to hypnotize or to work with people in altered states. But the business of, of Mesmer and animal magnetism really was about, uh, about hypnotism. And they used to have these great sort of meetings where cult-like groups of spiritualists would meet. And, you know, they would see this sort of floating, sort of ultravi ultraviolet or uh, neon green stuff floating in the air, and it was called ectoplasm. But before Neptune was actually sighted, the soul was incarcerated in orthodox religions of the three main gods, as I mentioned. And it was also, too, the beginning of the rebellion of women when the women began to, you know, go for the vote to really try and get their position uh, launched into the world, but, all, you know, and, and become, you know, equal, the equal rights really began in the 1800s. And um, also at, uh, you know, I mentioned already about gas, the, the cult of anesthetics began and, what we have today, and I have to make sure I'm not running over time, but what we have today from, from the sighting of Neptune and all these incredible, um, you know, uh, inventions of, in the drug field like anesthetic and nitrous oxide and um, oxygen, um, various, and cocaine uh, was extracted from the leaf, the alkaloid, which was used for eye surgery. Um, you know, of course, nitrous oxide was also used to, at fairs, you know, so you would, laughing gas is what it was called. But the thing about Neptune that really concerns us now, I think, and when I said it was toward or, you know, exploring the possibility of a spiritual astrology, 
most astrologers of our tradition, mine, and, and many millions of others, and there's others that aren't, others are still, you know, really very, um, you know, the traditionalists and so on, which is fine. Um, you know, it works. And anything works as long as you're working it properly. Um, but if you're looking into things that are spiritual or into, you know, the idea of soul-centered astrology, which was, you know, not introduced by just Dane Rujar. It was, it's, it's old, you know, soul-centered astrology. And, you know, to be able to think in terms of, of how astrology can give us an opportunity, you know, to really bridge that uh, place between the earth and the sea of liminality, where we can go, you know, into a place of absolute and utter, you know, like imagination, okay, because it has to do with that, or shamanic experiences. Shamans are very, very long lived. I mean, there has been shamanism since the, again, the beginning of time. It has always been involved with healing. And shamans have been using plants and herbs and roots and vines as long as humankind has ever existed. But it wasn't until Neptune was sighted that we could say that we have a serious drug problem here. I use that very phrase, and I'm using it from memory, in my first seminar, or one of my seminars for Royal Roads University in Victoria, BC, and one of my students, one of the people, I won't call him a student, he's a, uh, but one of my people in the class, um, he just about burst into tears, because the fact is, is that, you know, he did have a daughter who was um, just nothing but just a, a drug addict, yeah, just fell into that category. And that, so when I started talking about Neptune and the, and the seeking of God, uh, of the taking in of the spirit, of the pain that the person is in, the suffering of our, of our times, the global psychosis that is in motion right now as we speak is very Neptunian. And that Neptune returned to its own place in the same place as the United States does not mean it's the United States' fault, but it means that the United States being the most powerful country in the world and the nicest and finest one in the world um, has suddenly disappeared. And how did that happen? Overnight. That's weird, okay? So Neptune returned, big gold problems, big uh, oil, et cetera, et cetera. But to get into this um, idea of drug use, I mean, in the olden days as it were like in the 1800s 1900s there was morphine you know and co and laudanum and and the ladies would have a little laudanum at night before going to bed and so on so drug use is pretty ancient but what we have now isn't even vaguely shamanic it's not even a dionysian rite of passage a sacred ritual based on sacred origins it's it's a travesty against the nature of botanicals that that humanity has been given by the gods and Gaia as one of her gifts to the soul and to the healing of the psyche, which Neptune also rules, this vague thing called the psyche. So we're going to see over the next time to come, if we can remain still the strongest part of Western civilization, but who knows? You know, we don't know. I mean, I could be wrong, but I think that we'll be seeing a lot more and there has been. In fact, uh, the CIAS is now uh, uh, a medical marijuana research center, legitimate, okay? So, you know, it's becoming mainstream to look at the effect of psychotropic drugs on the psyche, yeah? Psychoanalysis is it basically maybe on its last legs. I mean, psychology has been a door, door opener. I mean, every, I mean, psychology has been since Aristotle, you know, where there were four or five types of madness. It's a whole other workshop. But there's some evidence to me that subsequent generations to mine, Pluto and Leo, are decreasingly interested in 19th and 20th century conventional psychology. 
they're interested in exploring alternative ways of perceiving their world. I have grandchildren, you know, that are really very cool. And breaking old ties that actually bind back to millennia, to the origins of time, and yet they are super hip and cool. Just got a picture of one of my granddaughters with her favorite rock star. They were there at an outside gathering and Albuquerque and it was on this so from the cell phone Neptune this image appears of my granddaughter with Vlosky I think his name was Wal Walski anyway the kids love him he's great he's great he's handsome and I'm going wow okay uh right I'm definitely not uh any I'm not 17 anymore 18 so the rise of a new generation of astrologers at this time is hopefully a guarantee that the reuniting, you know, the reuniting of the heavens and the earth and the astrology of our times will actually live to carry this gnosis, this knowledge, into a place where we stand on the threshold looking into the future and not really being able to understand what it is that's going on really don't understand what's going on because it's become too complicated. And when things become too complicated, they tend to uh, intro, uh, sort of curl in on themselves. And so when you think, um, for example, with Neptune having returned to its own sign, um, it puts the global transit of it as a collective experience. And so the collective experience is that we're actually in the middle of like a serious religious war, Jupiter, Neptune, together. Okay, like Jupiter is the old style religion, Neptune is what we want to see as a very beneficent, but and not, not like mindless, but state of spirit and soul, eudaimonian, the, the good spirit, the good soul, the basis of democracy basically so the religious wars that are occupying the middle east uh as well as more subtle acts of war like the loss of cultural boundaries the diaspora the dissolution of territory and place for people on our planet everything's disappearing and so you know we're getting a lot of chthonic of earth god stuff action as well because we're looking at an, a devolution of the being conservators of the earth and entering, you know, well, actually leaving behind this Anthropocene period where humanity has had more effect on its, on its nature than nature on humanity. So we're looking at a, a very... Um, phenomenal phenomenal period of time wherein it's important i think as astrologers to actually find and evolve a spirituality um and not a dogma in astrology for it to enhance the soul to bring to the client or the person or to your writing um you know your your experience of the soul and that numinous experience is something that's very hard to put into words, but it can be done. You know, one of my favorite books is, you know, that's my bedside reader is The uh, the Art of Happiness by the Dalai Lama. I mean, it can be that simple. I think we're really, um, are we out of time? Uh, yeah, we're getting close to the end, Erin. Okay. Um, does anybody want to make a comment on, uh, because it's, you know, it could go on for, for days, this talk. So <laughs> anybody else, would anybody like to, to offer me some, a question or? Okay. Um, Erin, could you please click on stop share so that we could go back to the panel um, when you're ready? Yeah. Okay. Great. I'm ready. Yeah. Okay. okay. Any questions, Bye. anybody? Questions or comments? There must be. There are so many great minds. In I'm just checking everybody looking. Yeah, I am looking. Um, come on. I have a comment. Yes. I have a comment, Erin. Thanks. I, I love Wendy. the way that, that 
Hi. I love the way that you're able to speak about Neptune. I, I always find that when I try and explain it to people, I get really kind of spacey and spaced out. Well, human uh, yeah, it's and, Neptune. I mean, that's I just why love I the way that you before I talk. <laughs> Yeah, but 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 you you always bring it around, you know. I, I, thank you. I I really appreciate that because you know that's the whole thing is Neptune is a it's like um, uh, an alembic, okay, where in the magic of alchemy it takes place. We do not know what the alchemists really were doing, but they wanted to take plumbum Saturn lead and turn it into arum gold and that process has been long lost but there's so much written on it and when i read it it's like i'm i suddenly become involved in the neptune world because it is the world of imagination of of transformation you know uh you know we've got a drug problem yes but, you know, the world is in pain. It makes perfect sense that sad, scared, pain, in pain people will, t will just do anything. Anything. Because okay? religion isn't working. Yeah? Can you hear me? Oh, I yeah. can. Sorry, were you still answering Sue's question? I was sort of rambling on a bit. Oh. Well, when you brought drugs back up, it made, this is Wendy. Hi, um, Wendy. I loved what you said about drugs and how um, we've taken the botanicals of Gaia and just, yeah. just the way you, I love that because I'll tell you, you know, I was smoking pot when I was 11 and opium. Oh, and wow. I had to wait until I was 18. Uh -huh. I mean, I just never ran into it until then. <laughs> well, I was a late, I'm so I was an early bloomer from the 1965 baby, but Wow. Um, and I, but I was having very powerful experiences. Yes. Yes. But, it's but, changed. But I also the, got addicted to ultimately sort of, but, but it opened me up on a whole nother level, but I was already open because I have a very Neptunian chart. Right. So, Same here. I've moon Neptune conjunction in Libra in the 11th house. And I got involved in groups and organizations doing light shows for rock bands in the 60s, and I was getting high all the time. Yeah, well, I was too. <laughs> I mean, that's what we did. But it was in a context. Yeah, See, so I, my mind was confirmed when I first ever, and I only took it three times because I didn't like it very much in the long run. But I took LSD, and I tell you, it confirmed something that I'd been seeking all my life since a child. And that was that there was a spirit world. There was a world out there that was all love and truth. Mm. Yeah. Well, I was already seeing that before drugs, but. Same yeah. here. But I mean, I was, you know, as a kid, what, what are you? Yeah. When I was doing that, like I, I took LSD too. And I could see the earth breathing. You could see the earth. Breathing. Oh yeah. I know. And I was like, well, I actually really didn't like it, but... That well, that's why I didn't take it very much. I mean, I'm not really fond of the idea of, you know, common anyway, use. So I, I just want to acknowledge what you said, because I thought about that. I thought, you know, that was a lot of my experience. It was very expansive for me, a lot of it. Well, thank you. Karen? Yes? Uh, this is, are you done with that last thing? Yes. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentation. Um, I have moon at seven degrees of Scorpio in the 12th <laughs> square uh, Pluto North Node in the ninth. And what you said about uh, moon from seven to 13 or whatever it was of Scorpio, I missed what that was. Could you explain that to me? Oh. Every, every discovery of, the, of each of the three outer planets, the moon is either at 7, 8, or 13 degrees oh. of Scorpio. Now, I have um, my Mercury at 8. My Mercury, Scorpio. my Mercury, my Mercury. Hello? Hello? 
Chuck, right. Yes, I'm here. Okay, right. So what I was saying was um, that it was interesting that all the discovery charts had the moon in Scorpio in those, you know, because it's it being in love with the mystery of being able to see the unseen, of going deeply, deeply into the core of either the universe or the soul. Yeah, and so that's what Scorpio is about. It can be very dangerous. It can be very healing. And it can be both. It's very interesting, too. Yes. Oh, thank you. You're very did welcome. You, did you ask me a question? No. Okay. I just, I don't hear it too well. So thank but, you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chuck. Um, just a question from me, Erin. Um, you were saying that uh, metals corresponded to the ages, that gold was yeah. Leo and silver was Cancer and copper and bronze, I think, Taurus, I think. And that yeah, because it's Venus world. Venus yes. rules copper. That's right. And then you said um, iron corresponds to Aries. But what? Yeah. What is the metal for Pisces? Neptunium. It's a. It's not a metal. It's an element. You see, we've moved away from the physical world. Uh -huh. We have. We are now engaging in some supernatural kind of a situation. So it's no, no, we, it's not a metal. So no, no, it's it's, 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 a, it, it's an it's actually a radioactive uh, element on the on the periodic table. It's not a metal. Lead is plumbum. It's a metal. Yeah. When you get into like uranium, polonium, newtonium, uh, plutonium, uh, you're getting into uh, radioactive materials, right? So neptunium is actually on the periodic cycle. Uh, I had it written down somewhere, but I can't find it. Uh, but anyway, it's on the periodic uh, table, and it is a radioactive neptunium. My goodness, that so is all the other so interesting. Uranium is, is on the periodic table. Neptunium and plutonium. Aha. Uh -huh. Excellent. Got it? Yep, got it. Got Thank it. you so much. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay, any final comments? Because we do need to wind down. Okay, that's it. So Thank would you, you all... You always inspire me. You always inspire me. I always have too much to say. And I'm <laughs> so pleased. I love doing my things for you oh, guys. Oh, gorgeous. Thank you so much from all of us, Erin. Thank, Thank you. Erin. Thank you so much. You're welcome. See you next time. <laughs> A bit of Neptunian chaos. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's all bells and whistles right now. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you too. Okay, we'll see you again, Erin. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.